classes, so I had to learn how to do that. Um, this gentleman lives in a series of structures. It's actually one household sitting up at 4,900 meters elevation. He was born in one of these uh, shelters, lived there his entire life. And he has actually really good information on how climate change has been affecting his backyard, essentially. Um, all of this peak, when he was a child, was covered by ice, and he has watched the glaciers retreat for the last 20 or so years. He can say exactly how he changed his land use. In simple terms, it was to shift up and take advantage of these exposed areas to move his cattle, his sheep, and his horses that he's raising up to a higher elevation, so a change in pasture land. So what I wanted to do in terms of climate change in the Andes is first, it's very visible, it's very important it's to think about um, what you might do if you're interested in how those biophysical factors are changing the vegetation is look at connecting these two boxes. So here's one part of a potential coupled system. Uh, temperature on the increase, at least in many parts in the very high Andes. Uh, increase in carbon dioxide, which we know is global, but might potentially affect uh, the dominance of particular plant species that might be sensitive to those increased levels. Uh, in the Andes, a lot of the parts I'm talking about, so say central Peru south, are predicted to be drier in the future. So I put that arrow facing downward. In fact, there are some parts of the Andes, in the northern Andes, are predicting the reverse. So it depends a little bit on where you are. And certainly something that's um, happening, but not well documented, not well documented, is that where the cloud forests are, it's apparently changing. So the belt of persistent clouds has shifted upwards in the mountain. So where you would have true cloud forests is a little bit higher in elevation than it was 20 years ago. All these things, I believe, will be progressive changes and will continue to change vegetation. The, the particular species that are most common or most dominant, their abundances, and then connected to that, all sorts of ecosystem parameters that follow the plants and then the animals that follow the plants and, and so on. Um, some of those would be mediated, not directly, but through changing soils. However, I mentioned that the Andes, wherever you go, unless you're in some really far away place, there's people. In fact, I've done things like be completely alone, sit down on a rock to rest, and someone walks by me, and you think you're far, far away, and in fact, you're not. Um, the, my idea then is that people are always observing the landscape, and they will shift to take advantage of newly available resources. So I can imagine, for instance, a scenario where those pasture lands change in that example I just showed you, where people perceive that, in this case, that man who lives right near the snow line, this is very obvious to him, that pasture lands are up. He would change his, if he has the capacity, that is, can he buy another cow and take it up the hill? Um, perhaps he has to do that by collecting things together in a collective um, community-based or family-based um, group to, to make those changes, but then shift up their land use, alter this, which then potentially feeds back and alters their potential. So it might change the pasture land, quality of the pasture, which then changes the land use and so on. What I'm finding is that just studying this part here without accounting for or setting up experiments that eliminate the possibility of a feedback from land use is absolutely essential. So somehow you have to build in that coupling. Um, it might be that it's great just to do this if you can set up exclosures, for instance, or exclude fire or some other thing. If not, then you have to account for the human presence. And it might be that you're interested more in the side anyway, that you're interested in how humans respond to a changing resource base. So how might that play out in the Andes that, that I know anyway? This is uh, one possibility, a lot of times when people are farming these slopes, it's a very hard way to make a living. The average farmer might have anywhere from five, six, seven, even 12 individual fields located over a range of elevations. So it's common that people form their farming practices in these intertwined mosaics. And as climate change will change productivity, at least according to my thinking, then the farmers could, at least at the start, use their mosaic of fields and shift varieties or shift species of crops that they're growing, or even shift the use of, of fields perhaps even higher or create new ones. The capacity to do that then to control, not that's to increase production, but to control the risk in this environment um, would be potentially available at the household level. Often you, there's community arrangements also.
also in getting access to that land. Uh, this is a big protected area right here, Boscoran National Park. So one possibility is as land use shifts up, they will shift into protected areas and there's a whole set of park people dilemmas that you would predict would, would um, be exasperated by um, climate change in the Andes. There's a typical example of this patchwork of uh, fields with moderate kinds of year-to-year -year change, say when you get with an El Nino event. A farmer could deal with that individually by abandoning a field or leave it in fallow for a year. There's a lot of flexibility in the system. Climate change <coughs> supposes that there might be actually a need for continual reevaluation and change. Um, Jennifer Lipton and I worked on this issue. She did her PhD actually right on this side of the, on this side and the opposite side of the Cordillera Blanca. Um, and we were looking at ways to take some of that information and start putting it into policy relevant forms that people could um, maybe act upon. We noted that the glaciers actually were important environmental buffers in this area. Uh, much of the farming that comes off the Cordillera Blanca depends upon uh, dry season water that's available for irrigation. And in fact, the farming season on the Cordillera Blanca is quite long compared to the Cordillera Negra right here, where there's no ice and all the agri all agriculture is rain fed. Uh, as these glaciers have retreated, there's obviously more chance of avalanches and increases in some kinds of natural hazards and dramatic decreases in water supplies, many demands for the water actually from here to end up being used down on the coast of Peru um, for um, a variety of different human needs. Another way to look at climate change is to go up to the very top of the Andes. This is an example um, that I can share with you down in, the, in southern Peru. The Calcaya ice cap, the world's largest tropical ice cap, studied in depth by Dr. Lonnie Thompson from Ohio State University for, I don't know, 29 years, 33 years, whatever it's been, his entire career. He's been working on this ice cap. This is Lonnie here. He invited Blanca to do the botanical part of research in the year 2005. And I went along first to carry the bags, and then I suggested that we do some extra things that I'll talk about right now. What they were working on is this mummified plant right here. This is the edge of the ice cap that's been retreated. It's gone back about a kilometer in, in distance in the last 20 some years. As that happened, it exposed these plants. These plants are rooted into the substrate, so they've been sitting in this place. They got covered over by the ice 5,200 years ago. So this means that the climate change, as it's affecting this part of the Andes, probably has not had this kind of intensity or characteristics for that time period, for those 5,000 years. There's incredible opportunities to look at, well, there, there are Blanca and some colleagues are getting DNA out of those plants, and there's a continuing um, set of things that they can look at. Let me show what I wanted to look at. Uh, that was the, um, the ecological succession up there. When you go up to the very edge of the ice, in this case, we're at 5,350 meters elevation. Um, and right here is the edge of the ice. As you move away from that ice, in theory, you're going back, back through time. So essentially, we have the ability to set up a chrono sequence here. We, uh, Monty Thompson knows the rate that this has been retreating. He guesses that back, at, back here on the corner is about 20 years old. So this surface here has been exposed um, from 20 years to zero by the time you get to the ice space itself. So what we did then, it was set up a transect and do sampling of both soils and vegetation out that about a half a kilometer from the front of the ice, going, in theory anyway, not only in distance from the ice, but in time. Many textbooks have this sort of classic diagram of primary succession, meaning that you're starting with raw substrate, you're not starting with soil itself. In this case, you're starting with rock materials and some dust that's fallen out of, out of the ice itself. You're starting with that and then plants are colonizing it and other organisms colonize it and you get primary succession. Uh, it's not often studied in the tropics and in, in fact, there's a lot of opportunities now to start at the ice, go out, of, out from it and have some sort of control on the rate that these plant communities are developing. I was impressed how fast things happen. Uh, there's an initial substrate that comes out of the ice itself, which consists of dust that's landed on the ice during 
thousands of years, maybe, maybe as much as.